This podcast is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Nothing stated on it either by its hosts or any guests is to be construed as psychological, medical, or legal advice. You are listening to Adoptees On, the podcast where adoptees discuss the adoption experience. I'm Haley Radke. Today's episode is a special episode in our healing series, where I interview therapists who are also adoptees themselves, so they know from personal experience what it feels like to be an adoptee. We are joined by Pam Cordano, talking about the seven challenges of adoptee attachment, which include profound ongoing chronic misattunement, disconnection from our instincts, and commodification. Before we get started, I wanted to personally invite you to our Patreon adoptee community today over on adopteeson.com slash community, which helps support you and also the show to support more adoptees around the world. We'll link to everything we'll be talking about today on the website adopteeson.com. Let's listen in. I am so pleased to welcome back to Adoptees On, Pam Cordano. Welcome, Pam. Thank you. It's so fun to be here with you again after a while. (laughs) (laughs) I know we get to talk regularly and you um, come to a lot of Patreon events, but you're not always on the main feed. We got to have you back on the main feed more. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I know that your insights for adoptees have been so tremendously helpful. And one of the things that we've kind of relied on for years as adoptees looking at adoption with a critical lens and how it's impacted us has been the primal wound, which is a little bit controversial sometimes because it was written by an adoptive parent. And so when I heard you do this talk on uh, seven challenges in adoptee attachment, I was like, oh, finally, like an adoptee is breaking these things down for us. And you put into words a bunch of things for me personally, and I know others who've heard you share this. So do you want to share a little bit more about this? And I don't know, do you think it relates to primal wound at all? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I do. Actually, that book was really important to me when I read it. And the primal wound, it, it gave a structure and started to outline something that that really resonated with ways I had been feeling inside that I didn't have language or concepts for. And so I was really grateful for that book actually when it when it came out. That was such a long time ago. But as I've lived more into my own healing as an adoptee and having been a therapist for a long time, I've I've been really grappling with are leading ideas about attachment theory and specific ways that I think that leading attachment theory is inadequate for us adoptees. I just started to think about trying to to name some specific things that are actually, that have substance to them that are in the way of us feeling comfortable attaching, not just to other people, but to the world at large and to our own selves, just attachment as a whole thing. Maybe maybe how this relates to the primal wound is maybe some of what I'm trying to figure out has to do with looking under the hood of us. And, you know, and it's not just more external and conceptual, but it's looking under the hood. Every time I get one of those new books, like what happened to you or, you know, you know, all, all the like the leading yeah, Gabor Mate book or, or Bessel van der Kolk or something like that. I literally always flip to the index first and see if they have adoption in it or adoptee. And I keep like looking for them to talk about us. <laughs> We're a good <Right>. case study. <laughs> yeah. And they don't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. I think that, I think it's very hard for somebody not adopted to understand what, what it's like being us under the hood. They're just describing cars, but we're like in the engine of, we live in the engine of us and it's complicated in here. Right. (laughs) Okay. So even like Nancy Verrier with a primal wound, right? She's looking Mm -hmm. from the outside. It's Mm -hmm. not her personal experience. Yeah. Right. Okay. You're under the Mm -hmm. hood. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Under the hood. 
And I'll just say uh, psychedelics have been huge in helping me get under the hood and helping other people get under the hood who are trying to understand these huge defense structures that have been keeping us alive from the beginning. It's very complicated in here. Well, before we get into the seven, can you sort of just set up why attachment is so important? And like, you know, I know you talk about the limbic system and the brain and and that. Mm -hmm. Can you kind of set that up for us? Yeah. Trauma attachment 101. This is this is what I guess what I would think is important to say right now is that we have our amygdalas. The amygdala is the fear center of the brain. And the amygdala is telling us that something dangerous is going to happen and something dangerous or something dangerous is happening. So it's looking for danger. And the amygdala is part of the larger system called the limbic system. The limbic system is a larger system. The amygdala is part of the limbic system. And the limbic system stores highly charged memories and manages all of our sleep and appetite cycles and our moods and our ability to bond. So the limbic system is where we bond from. (laughs) And the limbic system is where we need to connect with other people, with, with them and their limbic systems connecting with us. So that's where the party is of attachment, the limbic system. Okay? <laughs> okay. We're in the attachment okay. party. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> and that's one reason that when adoptees get together, it we don't even have to make a decision. We People can just feel the difference, the the safety being with another adoptee, even if our stories are very different, because there's a certain kind of mutual understanding that helps our systems relax. And then bonding can happen more comfortably and easily among adoptees. That's why adoptees are so important to each other. That's Get cool. It? That's really yeah, cool. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so, so there's this therapist up in Seattle who is not adopted. He's an attachment specialist. And I just said to him straight up, like, like I'm an alien. I was like, so, okay, explain attachment to me from your point of view. And he said, so I wrote down what he said. He said this, he said, the baby needs the mom's limbic brain to attune to the baby's limbic brain. When attunement happens, we feel safe. The baby learns she can be found by the mother. She is findable and worthy of being found. If someone finds her, she's not alone. If she is found, someone worked to find her. If this happens consistently, she does not need to doubt her value. She can be found in the deep, young places. As she is found, she also learns to find more of herself. So this paragraph has become very important to me because it just names the magnitude of what didn't happen for me, and I think what doesn't happen for most or any adoptee, because how can, well, pause, pause right there. How I, can how can a stranger I mean, fill in for that? <laughs> well, how, how can how can a stranger with a with an entirely different agenda, the agenda maybe is becoming a, a mother, becoming a father, starting a family, adding to a family, Conquering infertility. I, I mean, I, I don't know what the agenda is, but it, it often isn't the agenda of simply opening one's system to a, a horror of pain in a, in a baby. Like when I think, I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be dramatic here, but when I think about the day I arrived to my adoptive parents, I probably needed the Red Cross to show up, like with a helicopter and that silver wrap stuff that they wrap people in to keep them warm. Like I was a wreck looking back and hearing stories from my grandparents, like I'd, I'd stopped crying. I was, I'd been through six months of, of hell and had shut down natural systems like crying just to stay alive. That was the day that was so exciting to my parents. They, they, you know, they had the neighbors come over and it was like, it was like a celebration, like a brand new, you know, gotcha day kind of situation. So it was just, it's, it's not just like the limbic resonance wasn't there, but there was this massive um, misattunement, actually. And I don't know how that couldn't be the normal story. Do you? I mean, I'm just, I'm trying to put this together for myself because we have all kinds of different adoptee experiences. And 
I was like, you know, born in a hospital, left in a hospital for say 10 days before I went to my home with my adoptive parents. And you have this like interruption, right? You're with your birth mother, but she was neglectful and you were removed. That's your personal story that you've shared here a little bit before. And there's other adoptees who are, you know, with their families for longer and then they get removed, right? So at any point, there's always this gap (laughs) in care Mm -hmm. and we're with new people who are supposed to help us regulate in some fashion. But whether it's kinship or a full stranger, it's not the same. Right. And first of all, it, it's, it's hard enough for us. I'm almost 60 years old and I'm just starting to understand and, and feel into the magnitude of the trauma from my infancy. And in a really bodily way, as hard as I've been working on this, I, I've just started to make more progress in the last couple of years. What adoptive parent younger than me, A, can understand something about losing one's whole lineage and and the primal wound, and then secondly, do enough work on themselves to be at a place where they can resonate with a baby for, in a limbic kind of way, like open up to that kind of trauma. You know, it just doesn't really make sense that that would be something available. Is that even possible? That's maybe, this is maybe just like a hypothetical we can't even, you know, <laughs> say... But say an adoptive parent is so prepared and they know what they're getting into and and they've done all the work and things. I mean, in my mind, then they don't adopt <laughs> because then they know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so mm-hmm. I don't know if those things can even coexist. <laughs> yeah. Having a well, human so ready for a baby that suffered this catastrophic loss. Right. And I've I've talked about Cambodia before when I went to Cambodia and I met some orphans there that that were teenagers but had been orphaned when they were babies and in Cambodia following the genocide the babies names and stories were kept intact and were known by the families that took them in nothing was put on the babies to like to like now I'm your mom and this is your dad it was like we're here we're a family taking care of you and you can call us what you want you can call us you know auntie or first name or mother, father, if you want to, but that's up to you. Like it's your, it's your life. This is yours. You know, it's, it was very baby child centered. And I think that, and and then the families had known what the, what the, and had felt with the the children, what they'd gone through. Cause they, I guess they'd all gone through the genocide. So they all knew, but I think that that, that was better for them than what happens here with such a, such a, um, it's a one, two punch. It's like loss. And now, this fiction. Well, we've we've had this talk before, right? Like there's this, yeah, there's the, the relinquishment and trauma. And then there's also the trauma of, okay, now you have to fit where you've been put, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and I think, should we go through the seven? Because I think sure. some of that is like it. absolutely addresses that. Yeah. Okay. Seven areas of challenge specific to adoptees and attaching. So the first challenge is the adoptee body. The adoptee body is where the story lives. A theme in our community is all these ways that adoptees' bodies are not well, like digestive problems, sleep problems, autoimmune disorders, headaches. I've had cancer. Uh, It just, the body is, my body has been fraught with stress. And it seems like almost all of the adoptees I meet have a lot of this kind of stuff. For an adopted child, there, there are two stories going on. There's how well they're masking the trauma and trying to fit in and doing doing whatever, however well they're doing that. And then there's what the body's doing. The adoptee body is really where the story lives. And the, the, adoptee, the adoptee body is talking to us and to our families the entire time. So I know for me, I, I didn't sleep well at all as a kid. I still don't. And I also didn't eat that well either. I was, I was just eating was tough. Everything was tough. And eating was tough and sleeping was tough. My parents wanted to be good parents, and they saw these problems as reflect reflections that they were not doing something right. So it, it became centered on them. And so it, they weren't curious, like, well, why 
why is Pam having such a hard time sleeping and eating? What's going on? Let's try to get underneath this. I'm sure there are some adoptive parents that would that care about the body and are paying attention to the body. But for my parents, it was really about a reflection of them that they were doing something wrong or they weren't, you know, they they wanted me to show them that they were doing a good job, basically. You know, the body is where the story lives. What story is the body telling? And who wants to listen to it? And that really matters. Even for us now that those of us who are adults, adoptees who are adults, like we we want to really start to care about what, what the story our body is telling. And we want partners and friends and family to care about our bodies and the stories that are, because the body tells symbolic stories. Like if I can't be conscious of something that's going on and, and express it in words, that's one way that it shows up as a symbolic body thing. You know what I mean? Right. Because we've talked before about pre-verbal trauma. Right. So we might not have words for it, but it's like living somewhere. <laughs> right. Right. And it does show up. It, it does, you know, there's like the body doesn't, the body doesn't lie or the body keeps the score. You know, it's the body tells the truth. I think that a lot of adoptees are under, are under so much stress to deal with the trauma that they may not even be aware of, but it's there. And then be fitting in and masking and, and functioning as best they can as children and as adults. I don't think listening to the body is necessarily a high priority uh, when we're trying to survive. <laughs> you know, so no. it goes, it gets deprioritized. But I think that when we're really talking about attachment, we have to include the body. The body is a really wonderful truth teller. And it, it, it can be a nightmare to enter, but it's the place that we need to attach from. So we have to start to value the stories our own bodies are telling, and then be close to people who also value the stories our bodies are telling, so that we can at least be in reality. There's the quote by John Bowlby, British psychologist and psychiatrist, that I think was like the, the father of attachment, who said, what cannot be said to the mother cannot be said to the self. And so if we adoptees have nobody we can tell the truth to about this implicit trauma and that, that's running rampant in our systems, we can't tell ourselves either. And that's where it has to go into symbolism, it has to go into body problems, addictions, things like that, more indirect, but real signs of what we wish and needed to be able to tell to maybe both mothers, but can't, so that we can't tell it to ourselves. That sounds to me like so much of this is subconscious. Mm -hmm. And even for those adoptees that don't acknowledge <laughs> that adoption is problematic or has had uh, challenges or comes from a challenging system in place, like all of those things, like there's still something happening underneath the surface that just yeah. isn't safe to surface. Right. And it comes out eventually. Because it gets very hard over decades and decades to to hold these defenses in place to keep us alive. And things start to break down as we get older. And um, often that's a nightmare, but it's it's a gift because then we have a, a different, a new chance to have some access to it and to work some things through that could never be worked through before. Okay, what's number two? Okay, the second one is the enormity and value of belonging to lineage. When we lose our lineages, it's it's a massive loss. And I used to think of lineage as being a line, like there's me, there's my birth mother, there's her mother, there's her mother, like it went down a line. But now I think of lineage as a giant spider web with, with many, many, many points of connection and orientation for us. So to be removed from that entire spider web is a massive loss. And our culture doesn't treat that as a massive loss. There's a devaluing of remaining in one's lineage, the value of that. And so the loss of that, which happens in like one minute or one hour or one day is huge. We used to, I mean, I used to call it separation trauma or attachment destruction. I thought, I thought attachment destruction was a really bold way of saying something about this, this primal wound. But even that is like, it's a moment, attachment destruction. But when we think about the loss of a spiderweb lineage, we're like with we're like in a free fall out in the world without that net that holds everybody into place. So even you and I have talked about this before and picturing the web, it's like if we're gone, the impact of our absence 
also impacts the family of origin, right? Their web mm-hmm. has changed. Yep. And then I was thinking about, say, transnational adoptees. And so our yeah. web is is in a in a certain place. <laughs> and so yeah. if if you're from a different country and your web is in a different country and that's you know, that's also a place of comfort and safety and, and, and those kinds of things. Like, right, we remember <laughs> where we were um, yeah. and where our family has been. And so there's also that loss that's just compounding on It's it. huge. Yeah. It's huge. The yeah. smells, it's like, yeah, that if it's a place, it's not just all of the people, the points of, and the stories and the the, uh, the qualities of the lineage. But it's, yeah, it's it's the place. That's that's a whole big part of the web too, is the place. Or, you know, trans transracial adoption. Same thing. Yeah, I was just going to say, yeah, race, ethnicity, culture, mm-hmm. all of those mm-hmm. things are sort of like pieced together as a part of the web, maybe. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. Totally. Number three. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Number three. When we are plucked from the, or kicked out of whichever, however we leave that massive lineage web, we're in a free fall in a sense. There's, there's, we're not being held by all of the points that hold us. So more and more it's gotten out this, this new phrase called the nothing place. And the nothing place is a phrase we're using to mean no orientation points, free fall, terror. And um, a friend of mine shared this, this, nothing place thing with me. He'd done psychedelics and he'd found himself in the nothing place. And when he described it, I totally recognized it. And so at the time it was in 2021 and Heffern and I were doing a year of flourish, uh, 50 people, two days a week, we weekly meetings with adoptees. And I brought this nothing place concept, concept, ha ha ha. So it's like, <laughs> It's not a concept, it's real, um, to, to all of them and ask them to try it on. And I was shocked because everybody resonated with it and knew in some way that they were avoiding something about this terrifying freefall and into nothingness without the web. But we we haven't had language for this that's been adequate. And so it's just sort of like this monster that we're avoiding. Something I think that's the monster is the free fall. I was thinking, I've been watching this like travel show lately, and I was thinking like, if you were as an adult transported to a fully a different country and you had nothing with you, so you had the clothes on your back and you had no money, no passport, and you didn't speak the language and you didn't even know where you were and like how disorienting that would be. But yet you still have your brains and experience with you and you can kind of figure out like okay I need to you know I need to get help from somebody like I need to figure out where I am you you can kind of sort of figure out how to communicate and whatever so you have some of those like skills and I was thinking about how um, a baby or a young child right is just like like just alone and when you describe it as the nothing place like I think of myself you know like alone as a baby and like it's too scary to go there right it's just Mm -hmm. too scary to like even think about that totally and what you just said about the teep that the show um I may not have this totally accurate but I think with the highest level military people navy seals they they do an exercise where they they drop somebody off in a a foreign town and they have to survive for 4 days and there are some enemies i think there are you know quote enemies that are looking for them so it's like this 4 day trial in, of survival and i don't know i i think about us as babies and well there's the primal wound right we're already like reeling from this loss of lineage and then we don't recognize anything and we can, yeah, we can't talk nothing. Yeah. Because babies are and in really small children, right? We're fully at the mercy mm-hmm. of anyone, anything around us. There's no right. competence whatsoever. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. 
Um, I'm, I was just trying to think of other ways to explain this to someone who's not adopted. Uh huh. You know, and I just there's nothing like it, right? There's nothing like what's the what's the movie where somebody gets lost out in in space, just spinning around out in the oh. nowhere, <laughs> like an astronaut. Interstellar is that the right one? I don't know. There was a couple of space movies. <laughs> it's funny because just. I think that for not adopted people, they might say, well, you have loving people that want you, that want to make a home for you, that have paid a lot of money for you, that, you know, that have decorated a room for you. Like you're not out in space. There's people here. But that's from that's from adult humans that don't understand loss of lineage. I think the value of talking about the nothing place is getting back inside the adoptee and being adoptee centric and not not adoptee centric. It's interesting. I, I have I have a whiteboard full of ideas and everything for shows and things um, next to me that you can't see, but it's here. It's always there. Mm -hmm. And I've had the nothing place written on the board for several years, actually. <laughs> and I could never bring myself to ask you to do a full episode about it because it is so depressing to just think about that. And and I was like, God, I don't think I can talk about that for half an hour. That just mm -hmm. is like, <laughs> it's too much, you know. Well, right. And you know what? Trauma, the definition of trauma is too much, too muchness. It is too much, and it was too much. And that's what we're trying to say to the world. It's, it was too much. It is too much, and it was too much for yeah. us. Yeah. You might have been fine. We weren't. And art. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I was just thinking, you know, we're talking about different adoptee experiences and even open adoption, right, has been seen as this like panacea, like, well, but you still know who your birth parents are, or, like you still get meetings with them sometimes or whatever. However, open adoption agreements have been structured if they remain open, by the way. But it's interesting because I was thinking like, well, nothing, please. That still exists for open adoption. Oh, totally. Because yeah. the nothing place happens when we get separated from lineage. And then if when the birth the birth family comes back in, whether it's at six months, one year, every five years, not till the child's thirteen, whatever they just whatever the decision is, all of this trauma has already happened. And so then what part of the child is meeting their birth family? Uh, I I don't think it's an open limbic system. You know, it's, it, I, I imagine it from the adoptee's point of view, I imagine it being pretty scary to, to meet the people that let you go. Hmm. Even if it's regular. <laughs> yeah. 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 All the way along. Yeah. Mm. Okay. We got to move on from that. Okay. Place. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so the next one, the next one falls right into place, which is adaptation becomes the the primary survival mechanism. So we're in the nothing place. We got to survive. Every every living organism wants to survive. The replacement for orientation is adaptation. And we are doing everything we can to adapt to what's in front of us to survive. And we're really good at it. Adoptees are super adapters. That's why Paul Sunderland in his video about addiction, said that adoptees really surprised him when they would seem so put together and intact, and then the littlest thing would happen and they would, you know, lose it. Because we we can adapt, but that doesn't mean that we feel okay and it's built in inside. I'm stuck on the sentence. The replacement for orientation is adaptation. Mm-hmm. I, this just feels so profound to me just because it's going back to the, like the lack of orientation we have. It's frankly. Th and it could be very confusing then, like what's the real me versus what's just adaptation. It gets so confusing. It takes so long to figure that out. Can you just say like some examples of things that are adaptations? I mean, like literally just being the child of these new parents, like just having that identity is an adaptation, right? Yeah, being very perceptive. 
what do they want? What makes them smile? What makes them what what makes them love me more? Which would make me safe? I mean, I I okay, I I I'm less worried about saying something really offensive compared to how I used to be when I first met you. I was really, really worried about upsetting people, but I'm less worried about that now. So several years ago, I saw an article in the Huffington Post, and I forget which adoptee, I wish I knew which adoptee wrote it, but she said something like, I feel like I've said this on your show before, that when a baby is kidnapped, they are expected to remember their parents and reject the kidnappers. And then when a child's adopted, they're expected to forget their birth family and bond with the adopt adopters. And so if I were kidnapped, I would be paying, I would be using all my energy to survive. I would be trying to figure out the kidnappers. What makes them mad? What makes them happy? What makes them calm down? What keeps them from harming me? I'd be looking for everything I could do to maximize my survival. I think we do that as from the get-go. We just start getting very perceptive to survive because we've already had this huge threat to our life by this relinquishment. We're under it's it's like it's like quote attachment, quote attachment, which is an attachment under duress. You already said it. That's the literal survival mechanism. <laughs> right. Right. So I I mean, I guess it goes without saying, everything we're na- everything we're naming is a challenge in our ability to attach. So trying to trying to unwind these crisscrossed patterns and confusions to figure out, like, let's say, I don't know, since we're such good adapters, because we had to be, how do we attach when we get into a romantic relationship where we have to watch where am I adapting or what's real? And can the person I'm with tolerate the real me? And how about now? And how about now? Like it's a it's a process to start, you know, to become real with people so we can attach. You know what's coming to mind, and I don't know if this is the right place to comment on it, but I still see people sharing about reactive attachment disorder, which from the therapists that I know and respect, that's not a real thing. I think about, so so for people who don't know, it's sort of like if there's a child in your care and they're... um so, so to speak, acting out and you're, they're troublesome in some way to you as the adoptive parent, they'll often get diagnosed with reactive attachment disorder. And now I'm, as you're talking, I'm thinking like, well, these kids are the ones saying the, the truth out loud. <laughs> right. I don't belong here. What am I doing here? Get me out of here. How do I get out of here? <laughs> right. Do you do you have comments on reactive attachment disorder? Do you yeah. think that's a real thing? Like, look at this. I'm just looking up symptoms, right? Avoidance of physical touch or comfort when distressed. What I have heard a lot of adoptees say is, it was the wrong hands. It was the wrong bodies. I didn't. I didn't want those hands. I didn't want those bodies. I wanted someone who felt right. I remember my mom would always say to me, "Oh, I can't do anything right. I can't do anything right." It was like. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't want you. I wanted her. You know, I didn't even know who her was at that point, but I knew I wanted her. Um, unaffected when left alone. I mean, I found it a relief to be left alone because then I had less ad- ad- adapting to do. I could call, I could just relax. Emotional detachment. Yeah. Why, why emotionally attach when our, our deepest truth is absolutely unknown? It's very hard to attach when we have to keep most of us in, ourselves in the closet. Rocking or self-comforting excessively, inability to show guilt, remorse, or regret. Well, some, some, some kids are mad for good reasons, so they don't feel guilty for being mad. Tantrums, anger, sadness. Yeah, so the, the cure, quote unquote, for reactive attachment disorder, or like your, your, what you want to have happen is like that they adapt better and... Mm-hmm fit in better and behave Mm -hmm. that's the fix right 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 (sighs) victor frankl said an abnormal reaction to an abnormal situation is normal i think that sums it up (laughs) so we can put a dsm diagnosis on it but or we could just say normal yeah and then and then the child has to carry the adopted child has to carry the abnormal 
instead of the situation, the the institution carrying the abnormal. Yeah. That's what's abnormal. Right. So medicating the child, sending them off to whatever home. Boot camp. Yeah. Yeah. All of those things. It's never the fix on the situation. And not that every situation can be fixed, but adoptive parents in that situation obviously need better tools and they need to be working on themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, Anyway, Mm -hmm. that's a full aside, but I thought that kind of went, okay, what's our next one? This this bridge is right to the next one, which is (laughs) profound chronic misattunement. So adoptees are swimming in a fish tank of water that is profoundly chronically misattuned. And this is from inside the family and outside the family and inside their own selves, with themselves. There's just this misattunement. It, it, it's everywhere because we can't be understood in this deepest place and we can't understand ourselves in the deepest place easily. It takes I think it takes decades. And then adoptive families don't know how to, I mean, we're barely learning how to understand our own selves, how our adoptive parents and families can understand what, what we're trying to understand about under the hood. And then the, the culture at large is has got, you know, sparkles and rainbows on top of this. So I think I shared with you, Haley, that there's this public figure that I I like. And she and her partner adopted a baby. And before they even got the baby, they were calling the baby their soulmate. And I felt so turned off and upset just that a baby is getting burdened with that with that story, that label, without participating in an agreement of soulmates or in an agreement of the narrative about soulmates. It sounds nice on the surface, but it isn't nice for the adoptee. What? Say it again. I can't even say, I, say it. You've said that to me before. <laughs> it just makes me want to barf. And I'm just going back to the, like, adoption is this problematic thing. That once you see it, once we pull up and show you under the hood, like how could you unsee that? Right. Oh, yeah, yeah. I have all of these like things going on in the back of my head always. How can I show non-adoptees, you like to call them muggles, the truth behind what our experience is? What works most effectively to tell people, to show people so that we can stop the madness? Mm -hmm. And I'm always looking for those things. One of the things that just boggles my mind is the like videos on Instagram or TikTok where it's like, oh, here's your new baby. And everybody's like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe you're adopted. This is wonderful. So amazing. And then the same people are like oh my gosh, you're reuniting with your birth parents. Oh, it's so wonderful. It's so amazing. Like, how how do you not see the disconnect? So you're talking about swimming in the chronic misattunement of society. Like, mm-hmm. it's it's like, uh, who's p- pushing them rock up the hill? Who's that? <laughs> That's what we're doing. <laughs> the yeah. boulder, the boulder yeah. up the, or whatever. It's yeah, never going to yeah. get there. <laughs> right going to run over us yeah exactly it has it has ran me over for sure again (laughs) i am smushed at the bottom of the mountain yeah 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 well even these um gotcha day celebrations Mm -hmm. um i had recently cam lee small on the show and in his new book he talks about the gotcha day misses lost you day (laughs) like you know it's very it's incredible to me that people yeah. can see that and not see where did this baby or child come from? They came mm-hmm. from somewhere. How are you celebrating what could be the worst day of their life? <laughs> like, and do you think the baby doesn't know this? It hasn't, isn't the one experience, like we're bodies, we're in a body. Like you think that we don't experience the entire things and it's registered and it's the core of our nervous systems developing. Like we're like, we're not even there. Like we're a cartoon or something. It's like cartoon life. I'm picturing someone sort of newish to this listening to us. <laughs> We've become, you know, so radicalized, 
we we have our eyes wide open <laughs> and it's just like this this whole conversation might just come across as like wild and new, but it's like facts are facts yo like i don't know what to tell you <laughs> just, yeah like i'm i'm it, it is it, i don't have the energy to twist myself inside out anymore and pretend <laughs> it's something else yeah 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 exactly okay so the sixth thing then the result of swimming in this profound chronic water of misattunement is we get we get profoundly disconnected from our own instincts and we start to say yes where when we have a no or no when we have a yes and we think things that are not dangerous are dangerous and we think things that are dangerous are not dangerous we get really screwed up in our in our own instincts maybe not entirely like the 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 quote angry adoptees that grow up like i was more of i i had i had both i had compliance and i had anger the anger was at least a remnant of connection still to some of my instincts. Like I remember, you know, being 14 or something and yelling at my mom in the kitchen where my dad could hear and saying, you're not my real parents. You're just my guardians. And you bought me. And, you know, and that was true, but it was blasphemy. I knew that I was going to get grounded and I was breaking their hearts and just saying the truth. But I got pushed to a point where I could connect back in to something to something I knew that was true. I'm I'm going back to thinking about adoptees who have done their all to fit in and to absorb the adoption is beautiful narrative and even in fact maybe like I did, I felt like um, I owed it like and to adopt myself to sort of like pay it forward, you know, those kinds of things. And what a profound disconnection that was to not see. <laughs> yeah. There is like mega shame there for me. I know I know I've said that out loud before. I know that's not the first time people might hear me say that, but like, it's so, it feels so shameful now to think like, oh my gosh, I almost was complicit in this system and that sucks. And then for folks who have gone ahead and done that, mm -hmm. you can't admit it because it's not safe. Mm -hmm. And there, that's where there's a lot, so much shame too. Yeah. But you know, to be, in your case, what you said about shame, about almost being complicit I think that's evidence of how hard you had to survive, how hard you had to adapt. Like we we can just think it's a it's an us thing, but it's it's the whole system that that leads to that kind of a decision of like, oh, should I adopt or whatever? I know I've I think I said this before somewhere, but that when I was like seven years old, my mom's friend wrote me this really pretty card and mailed it to me with little bunnies on it. And it said, I as I was going to sleep tonight, I was thinking about how lucky, how lucky you are as such a young person that, that you've been blessed twice so early in life, first by a mother that loved you enough to give you away, and then by a mother that loved you enough to take you in. I just remember the, huh? You know, feeling, what? And I knew I was supposed to really cherish this card. But it didn't, my body was like, it had nowhere to go because it just didn't fit. Love is not giving people away. That is not love. Love does not give people away. And also, my parents didn't love me enough to take me in. I was the next baby to come up on the five-year wait list that was a healthy white female. So that's why I ended up with them. It was all sequential. It had nothing to do with me. This is back to misattunement soup. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Discussion from instincts comes yeah. from that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the last thing, this number seven is, okay, commodification. We, we babies and children who get adopted are turned into a commodity. We're reduced to a commodity. A price tag is put on us based on what the context is for the adoption and money is paid. And we're purchased. And without the, that purchasing, uh, the parents wouldn't have the babies. That's a requirement. So 
even though a lot of adoptive parents might say, oh, I don't believe in commodifying humans. I don't believe in buying and selling humans. I don't believe in human trafficking. That's just how the system is. So that's just how it works. That That is commodification. That is purchasing humans. And the thing that's important about this for us under the hood is that commodification is a lived experience for us. It's not just a fact of a system. It's a lived experience. And our bodies experience being reduced to a commodity and to pile on to this in, this problem with disconnecting from our instincts is we don't we don't even know who does this body belong to is it me or is it them or is it society or who does who does this country belong to the, who does this world the planet belong to who does this cosmos belong to if people are religious who does god belong to or you know because there's such a disconnection from owning one's own body and self and life. Our life gets usurped. And then we have to wake up, come out of the fog, and get the right help and enough of it to start returning to a state of belonging to our own selves again. And other people don't have to think about this the same way. I mean, they might have had a strict religious or abusive family, but it's not nearly to the magnitude that we're talking about here. This continues into adulthood, where adoptees who are looking for original birth certificates or, or adoption records, those kinds of things, they're like filed in <laughs> in the same place in the court. Um, from what I understand, it's like items, <laughs> like um, in the legal system, we're commodified there too. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that very well, but I, I just, uh, even, even in adoptions that are public, um, like mine was, there's costs being paid, even if it's by the government or, any of those things, there's still financial transactions happening, whether or not adoptive parents actually are the ones to write the check. Uh, just to, I'm just going to say that in case people mm -hmm. are like, well, nobody paid any money for me. Somebody did. Actually. Well, I was a county, I was a county adoption in California and my parents paid $5,000 for me. And then when I was 25 years old and I went to the court to get access to my birth certificate, um, I was I was told my dad my adoptive dad came with me, and I he, we were told I had to leave the room for him to be able to see the file of the case where he was the plaintiff by adopting me. So I had to leave the room for him to see the, my birth certificate, and you probably know that in California we still don't have access to our birth certificates. It's bizarre. And I, I think that, you know, I, I could get hung up on that, but I think that, that for me, the deeper place about all of that is in my own body and that alienation from my right to my own life and my own self uh, and, and living in a world where this has all been allowed and still is still allowed. So if you were to go on to um, a website today from most adoption agencies that are looking for mothers in a crisis situation and you were to chat or fill out a form for like seeking help, they will ask your ethnicity <laughs> to determine the potential value of your baby. Mm. Um, so there's still a price put on um, or a value put on what your skin color is um, or if you're biracial or um, that's still actively happening. So there's an added weight as well for our fellow adoptees who are people of color mm. and are seen from the world's perspective as valued less than uh it's like, 
I mean, you know, I'm just, I'm just saying it out loud because that's what's happening. Yeah. And so, yeah, yeah, it's really it's a whole additional burden. Yeah. Layers yeah. of burdens. I don't know what to say because this is like <laughs> so. It's like I love having the words and language to describe all of the different issues that sort of like wrap up into this ball of like, oh, this is why I might have some issues. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. It's it's hard though. It's really hard to think about it. It's hard to look at it because it feels like, well, that's too big. <laughs> that's too yeah. big. I don't want to address that. I want to hide from that. That's scary. It's easier to put that to the side. I want to blend in in society. I want to like... I can't be looking at this right now. Yeah. Um, do you want to just talk to adoptees that might feel that way? Um, or give us like, like, I don't know, one next step. Cause this is like mm -hmm. overwhelming. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Like when Haley, when you and I hang out, we usually have a lot of fun. We, we this isn't like what we talk about. We, we have fun. <laughs> Yeah, we do. I know. We have, like, this we have depressing. parties. <laughs> yeah, this is depressing. But I think that um, I don't think we necessarily have to dwell in all of these things. I think it's just good for us to start. Of some of this could be helpful in just clicking our awareness, maybe maybe clicking some confusions in ourselves back into the right spot, so that we we just feel more lined up in a way that makes sense and maybe more ground underneath our feet, but. First of all, we adoptees need limbic resonance. And that's, uh, it's hard to even, I didn't know even seven years before I was in ago, seven years ago before I was in adoptee land, I did not understand the value of hanging out with adoptees. I did not want to be part of this club and I didn't want to talk about adoption and be with, I just wanted that to go away. But actually, uh, adoptees need each other so much. And that's why this this show and adoptee events are so powerful because our nervous systems can relax and we can we can feel much more limbic resonance than we're used to feeling with each other in places that are very important and also maybe heavy and difficult. But once we can connect on the difficult stuff or even knowing that the difficult stuff is a place of connection, we can relax and having fun and is, is also a whole part of, this, of the, the picture. When Anne Heffern and I did adoptee retreats, we started a little heavy, but then quickly it lightened it lightened up and we laughed harder than I usually laugh anywhere because there's a lot to laugh about too and enjoy. It's fun to enjoy just feeling connected in a, in a new way without the stress of that barrier between people who get it and people who don't. So limbic resonance is huge. Also, if you're seeing a therapist, make sure your therapist can feel you and you're feeling felt because without that, it's there's no point really. And therapy. Interesting. It, I, I think our intuition is very good on that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so I hope people can have permission to like, to like trust that. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you. And then the next thing is just that, uh, well, I just said two things at once, limbic resonance and adoptee community. Those two things are, I think, essential for us, for our healing. I just, I don't know a better, faster way to heal and feel more comfortable in our skin than that, than those two things. And then psychedelic assisted therapy is huge. I think that the the walls that keep us outside of the hard places are so thick and they're built to keep us out and going to see a therapist once a week and talking about it. We can talk about things, but it's hard to get underneath through the wall into the hard places. And especially where the body is, um, where the body has taken over the pain and the trauma and we're not even aware of it anymore. And so I encourage people to research psychedelic assisted therapy, MDMA, psilocybin, and, uh, and others too, uh, ketamine for some help to get under the hood. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, Pam, you have, um, you and I have been friends for, I guess, seven years <laughs> since mm -hmm. the first time you came on the show and, You've said so many amazing things to us that have opened up 
opportunities for connection and healing. So thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like this is like a culmination <laughs> of like all of these conversations we've had and, and all the work you've done in the adoptee community. So um, I'm so appreciative. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Haley. Thank you. Um, where can people connect with you online? The best way, I'm off social media five years now. My kids uh, taught me some things and I got off social media. So um, Lucky. It's kind of nice. Um, <laughs> so my email is the best way, pcordano at comcast.net. Okay, perfect. And we'll have that in the show notes for you. Also, if you don't have a pen handy right now, you can click back through later. Um, thank you so much, Pam. Thank you. It's, it's a pleasure being here. And hello to everybody out there. I'm happy to be here talking about this with you. It is always such an honor to have Pam on the show. If you want to hear the other episodes she's been featured on, we will link to those in the show notes for you along with her email address. And, you know, she regularly is a guest on our Ask an Adoptee Therapist events and our off script parties, which is an opportunity for you to meet fellow adoptees who want to talk about these things and build that community that she was talking about today that is so important. And I'm so truly, deeply grateful for her wisdom and the way she shows up for us in those spaces. So my big thanks to Pam, and I hope that you'll consider joining us, adoptiesoncom slash community. And if you want to see any of the upcoming live events we have on for these things, we'll have more things going on in the fall, uh, but you can go to adoptiesoncom slash calendar and see a link of all the past things we've done and then all the upcoming off script parties, ask an adoptee therapist events, book club, documentary club, all those good things. Um, Great opportunities to meet fellow adoptees. Okay, friends, thanks so much for listening. And let's talk again soon.